We are now going to study some more function properties, specifically the different ways in which a function can be invertible. So to begin with, we have the idea of a left inverse. So the definition is that a left inverse to a function f from a set x to a set y is defined to be a function g that goes in the other direction, so g is a function from y to x, such that g composed with f is the identity on x. So you can see why it's called a left inverse to f. So g appears on the left of f in this composition, and hence it's called a left inverse. So to describe this um, definition slightly differently, um, what we could we say instead? Um, that is equivalent to, uh, for all little x in big X, we need to have that g of f of x is equal to x. That's what it means for g composed with f to be equal to the identity function. So you can see that what's happening is this function g is somehow undoing what f does. It's getting you back to the x that you started with. So there is an example here of two functions. We have a, which is going to be a function from the real numbers to the non-negative real numbers, and the rule is that a of x is equal to x squared and b going in the opposite direction, so from the non-negative real numbers to the real numbers, defined by b of x is the square root of x. And I claim that actually a is a left inverse to b. So the reason for this is if we let x be an element of the non-negative real numbers, then a of b of x is, well, b of x is root x, so this is root x squared, and square root of x squared is x again. So what we've seen there is that a composed with b is equal to the identity on the domain of b, the non-negative real numbers. So what we get out of that is that a is a left inverse to b. Now in general a function which has a left inverse might have lots of different left inverses. So all I'm saying here is a is one possible left inverse to b. There might be others. Now let's think about whether a itself has a left inverse. So a is a left inverse to b. Could a have a left inverse? So what would that function be? Well, left inverse to a would be a function from c from the non-negative real numbers to the real numbers. So let's think what properties that would have to have. I mean, the part of the definition is that then c composed with a would have to be the identity function on the domain of A, on the real numbers. And let's see what that would actually entail. So for example, C composed with A being the identity, it must be that C composed with A of 1 is equal to 1 again. Well, A of 1 is 1 squared, which is 1. So what we've got there is c of 1 is equal to 1. All right, now let's look at another real number, minus 1. c of a of minus 1 must equal to minus 1, since c composed with a is supposed to be the identity on uh, the set of real numbers. So a of minus 1 is minus 1 all squared, which is 1. So I've got c of 1 is equal to 1, and c of 1 is equal to minus 1, right? This is not possible. This is a contradiction. OK, so we've concluded that um, a does not have a left inverse. There is no such function c. It can't, can't be any function c, which takes two different outputs for the input 1. And you can sort of see what's gone wrong here. The problem was that a was not 1 to 1. 
So in subsequent videos, we're going to study the connection between function properties of one-to-oneness and onto-ness and invertibility properties, and we'll make this precise. So let's look at the opposite idea to a left inverse, which is that of a right inverse. A right inverse to a function f from x to y is again a function g going in the opposite direction from y to x with the property that f composed with g is the identity on y. And again, you can see this is called a right inverse to f because in the composition f composed with g, g is on the right of f. So another way to say this, um, to, to express that this composition is the identity will be to say that f of g, well, let's actually say this uh, slightly differently, that is for all y in y, we have that f of g of y is equal to y. And let's actually revisit the same example we saw before. We have the same function a from the real numbers to the non-negative real numbers, which is has the rule a of x is x squared, and b will be the function b from the non-negative real numbers to the real numbers, which is given by the square root function. And then, in fact, we've already seen on the last slide that a composed with b was equal to the identity on the set of non-negative real numbers like this. So what that tells you is that b is a right inverse to a. OK. Now let's ask a similar question to the one we did last time, which is, does b have a right inverse? So b um, definitely has a left inverse. a, does it have a right inverse? So it's right inverse, uh, right inverse to b would have to be a function from the real numbers to the non-negative real numbers. And the property would it would have would be that b composed with c would be the identity on the set of real numbers. OK, well, in particular, what would that tell us? Let's plug in a value. So in particular, we would have that b of c of minus 1 would be equal to minus 1. b composed with c is the identity function, so b of c of x is equal to x for any real number x. And in particular, b of c of minus 1 would have to be equal to minus 1. That's not possible because b does not take negative values. The square root function is always greater than or equal to 0. So this is impossible. Um, because b of x is always greater than or equal to 0 for any uh, x in the domain of b. So b does not have a right inverse. And this time you can see really that the problem was that b was not surjective. So there's going to be a connection between having a right inverse and being a surjective function, which we will prove later on. So final definition is the definition of a two-sided inverse. A two-sided inverse to a function f from x to y is a function g going in the other direction from y to x such that f composed with g is the identity on y and g composed with f is the identity on x. So in other words, this function g is both a right and a left inverse to f. Uh, let's take a quick example of a two-sided inverse so, for example, if I took f to be the function from the non-negative real numbers to the real numbers, given by f of x is so log to the base e. Sometimes people call this ln, or sometimes they just call it log, but I'm going to call it log to the base e to be completely, um, to com completely unambiguous. And g will be the function going in the other direction, so from the real numbers to the non-negative real numbers given by g of x is equal to e to the power x, then I claim that um, 
f is a two-sided inverse to g and g is a two-sided inverse to f and the reason for this is if you look at log to the base e of e to the x that's going to be x for any x a real number so that tells you f composed with g is the identity on the real numbers and of course it works the other way around as well e to the power log to the base e of x is equal to x for any non-negative real number x so g composed with f so here we've done f first the log function first and then done the exponential function to that is the identity on the set of all non-negative real numbers so f composed with g is the identity on the domain of g g composed with f is the identity on the domain of f and that means that g is a two-sided inverse to f and similarly f is a two-sided inverse to g now let's record this so f is a two-sided inverse to g and g is a two-sided inverse to f so final piece of vocabulary we say a function is invertible if and only if it's got a two-sided inverse so these two functions f and g on this slide are invertible they have two-sided inverses